Hello everybody, welcome to LateralAction.com. This is Mark McGuinness and I'm very pleased to welcome Joanna Penn. Hi Jo, how are you doing? Hi Mark, thanks so much for having me on. Well, it's a real pleasure. So, um, many of you will know Joanna already, but for those of you who are new to her work, she leads a double life. Firstly, as J.F. Penn, author, US, New York Times and USA Today best-selling author of, you call them thrillers with an edge. Can you just explain what, what exactly they are? What, what kind of an edge is it? Yeah, so it was funny because, you know, I mean, not you don't need a tagline as a fiction author, but my friend CJ Lyons, who you've had on Lateral Action, yeah. uh, who's brilliant, you know, she has a great one, Thrillers with Heart. And I was thinking, you know, what do I write? And I write kind of, I write action adventure, but I also write supernatural things. And I write on the edge of horror, on the edge of action, on the edge of, you know, paranormal, supernatural, religious, you know, so th this edge for me is the edge that you walk in this world I guess between what could be a one genre or another what could be faith versus science what can be spirituality versus religion so that's kind of my edge I, I feel like most of the most books I write I, I'm, I'm walking some kind of edge right so there's quite a few edges in there <laughs> all right and then so that's by day and then also by day but maybe other times as well. You are Joanna Penn, host of the Creative Penn podcast and blog, and author of an ever-expanding series of non-fiction books for creatives on topics like presentation skills and marketing books. And the reason we're talking today is that Joe has written a really great book. It's called Business for Authors. Have I got the title right? Yes, Business for Authors, How to Be an Author Entrepreneur. That's right. Okay. So, and long-time readers and listeners at Lateral Action will know that one of the big things I've been trying to encourage people to do is to stop thinking like needy artists or uh, freelancers living hand-to-mouth and start thinking and acting like creative entrepreneurs. So take your art, your creativity, and unlock some of the value of the intellectual property that you're creating each time you create a piece of art and start to create a thriving business around that. And Jo is one of the exemplars of this. She's one of the people I say, look at Jo, look what she's doing. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think it's a really great book. And I want to say up front, although obviously it's called Business for Authors, it's a lot of the content is relevant whether you're a writer or you're a designer or you're another kind of creative. Some of it is obviously specific, but... The uh, you know, the fundamentals, I think, are going to be very relevant. So so don't think, oh, no, I'm not an author. Uh, this isn't going to be relevant for me. Trust me, there's going to be a lot in what Joe says that will uh, touch a chord if you're uh, self-employed as a creative. It's funny you say that, actually, because... I started out as how to be a creative entrepreneur. It was the first draft was aimed at. I had a whole section for you know Etsy people and you know designers and had some for for uh, sculptors and artists and you know I because you're right. Pretty much everything in here is it's how to run a small business. <laughs> but as yes. we as we know, um, you you can't write a book that's really wide. And how how to run a small business is just way too wide. In the same way that my how to market a book is essentially, you know, the principles of how to market anything um, with a couple of chapters about Amazon, you know, that I think. So thank you for saying that, because I agree. It really is just a it's a book, a business book for creatives. Yeah. And, and I mean, you know, because logically you're right. It is how to run a small business. And yet the emotional side, I think, is so critical. And what I really like, and particularly at the beginning where you address the whole mindset issue and the resistance that uh, a lot of us have, I certainly did, to anything to do with the very idea of business seemed to be the work of the devil. And I, I love the way you reframe that and the way you show that it's, well, well you, you, you know, I mean, give us the answer that you give in the book. What, what do you say to the creative person who says, I'm just not interested in running a business at all? 
Well, I think, you know, there's there's two ways to look at it. It's, you know, the one person who really just isn't interested in business and is just doing this for a creative reason. Um, and, and that, like, helping my dad publish his book for his 65th birthday, that was, like, just a creative project, something to say, I've done this. It was never going to be a commercial project. But for people, what's so funny is so many people say, oh, I, I'm not worried about business, I don't care about the money. And then they get all angsty when they don't sell any books. <laughs> so, yeah, which so, is kind of <laughs> yeah, which is kind of you know Something's weird. It's not matched up there, is it? No, it's not. And I think this is the big thing for creative professionals. And um, the and the biggest thing is, if you want to get out of your job, if you want to actually make a living as an author or as a you know a creative professional, you have to think about this other side of things. And if you leave it to other people, if you you know if you have an agent or a publisher and you just leave it to other people, things may well get out of control. And, um, you know, there's there's been a lot of cases of, of people losing control of, of their money. Harper Lee uh, with To Kill a Mockingbird. It's the saddest thing, you know, her suing her agent after yeah. whatever it is, 50 years. You know, the only book that she ever wrote, you know, this masterpiece. And she's at her age having to sue someone. So I think if people don't look after their own business... Yeah, you can just lose you can lose touch with all of that. And the other thing is that I think if you think about it at basic level, being a uh, creating a business is one of the most creative things you can do. Uh, so I work with you know eleven other professionals uh, in my work. Um, you know I collaborate with other authors. I've creating a business, creating wealth, creating something new in the world is just fantastic. And so I think when people use the word business, it can bring up, you know, pinstripe suits and things in, in the brain. But actually, it's all the exciting things about creating value from ideas, which is essentially what an entrepreneur is. So I am trying to reframe this as the most creative thing you can do is be a business person. <laughs> Well, you're preaching to the converted here, um, and I also know there's a lot of people, you know, everyone's at their own stage for this kind of journey. Mm. So, you know, I, I really wanted to bring this up right at the beginning for those of you who are thinking, I want to do my own thing, but maybe it's not even that I don't like the idea of doing business, but I'm not even sure I could do it. I mean, that, that for me was a huge thing at the beginning, which is having the confidence to think that I could do mm. the business stuff. Um. And also, I guess there, there is a, a very author-specific version of the question, which is, you know, the authors who say, well, I like the idea of, you know, self-publishing sounds great, but it also sounds like a lot of work. Hmm. I would rather just have a publisher who does all the, the business stuff for me, all the marketing, all the distribution, and I just write my books. Hmm. What would you say to an author who's coming from that place? Well, I think, I mean, the world has changed quite a lot um, to, to what it used to be. And for one, a lot of publishers want authors who already have books that have been edited professionally. They want authors who already have a marketing platform, maybe a blog, an email list. You know, they, they want authors who are already in a network with other professionals. Um, so you may well have had to start building all of this stuff already. You know, you, you, you and I know building a website uh, at the beginning, it can be very daunting in the same way as like writing a book at the beginning can be very daunting but over time yeah. these things grow so it's definitely a journey but it, even if you get a publisher you still have to think about you know let's just take the basics you still have to think about income <laughs> um, and you know th things like that people authors often just assume that as soon as you get an agent or a publishing deal the money just starts rolling in and um, in the yeah <laughs> yeah you laugh I laugh um, but realistically, there are lots of things about that. For example, most advances, if you get an advance, are split into percentages. So you might get one on signing, one on when the ma when the manuscript is finalised, and one on publication, which could be two years later. Um, and then, you know, that's split between all different kinds of people. So it, even just doing the basic maths, if you have a publisher, is something you need to think about. Um, and then things like caring about your contracts, um, for example, I have a terrible example of a, a friend of mine who signed a contract in New Zealand for um, full worldwide rights, all formats, and they only ended up publishing her book in New Zealand in print format. And I'm like, 
but you signed away everything and they're not, not even going to exploit all of those rights. So what I think the, what I'm trying to do with, the, with this book and in general is trying to educate authors and creatives to think about how much their work is worth and then think about all the stages of the journey, um, which go also for us, go for the rest of our lives. So, you know, having to think about the longer term ramifications of signing away the rights, you know, for, for your whole life. I mean, you've got kids, right? Your, yeah. kid, your kids can benefit from your books. I mean, that's amazing. <laughs> but only if you set it up right. So these are some of the... and. and I, I I know this topic's kind of not sexy, but it's so important. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is if you get it right. Yeah, it is sexy if you get it right, and if you get it wrong, then it's profoundly unsexy. Yeah, well, we're the ones rolling in the crystal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anybody who's watching the video version of that might. <laughs> we might have to edit the crystal in. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good idea. <laughs> All right, so that, that's the big picture of, of the whys. Maybe you could actually tell us a bit about your journey from writer to what you call now author, entrepreneur, and just, yeah. as a, you know, and, and just talk about what prompted you, what motivated you to go on that journey and, and how you found it. Yeah, so I, was, uh, I did theology at university, which is kind of a random degree, and then I became an IT consultant, uh, really, you know, mismatch immediately. Um, and I then spent 13 years working as an IT consultant, implementing accounts payable into large corporates, possibly one of the most boring things you could ever do, but, inc but very well paid. I traveled a lot, um, traveled around Europe and the US and Asia Pacific. So I had this kind of great traveling life, but my daily work was A, boring and B, kind of soul destroying for uh, somebody who had thought when they were younger, I thought I was creative and every day this was bogging me down. So I spent 13 years trying to escape my job. <laughs> Um, and I tried various things. I was a, I ran a scuba diving business in New Zealand and I did property investment and none of that worked for me. And I just couldn't figure out how did I end up with a house and a husband and a car and all the things you're meant, and a great job and good money, all the things you're meant to want in life and not be happy. So I started to write a book. Um, I started to read a lot of self-help and then um, write self-help for myself. This was like 2006 um, now. And essentially that first book, I wrote it and then I, then I started to learn about the publishing industry, discovered how long it would take to get a book deal, decided I was not interested in, in waiting or asking permission to do anything, um, started to learn about self-publishing, started blogging, and that kind of started me on the journey of writing. So at that point, I was a writer. But, it, but just going back, like you say, the kind of mindset, back in 2006, I had an affirmation, which was, I am an author, I am creative. And I couldn't even say, I am creative out loud, you know, back then. Oh. It, it, I couldn't even say it because I did not believe it. And to say, I am an author, as an affirmation, was... I couldn't imagine it at that point and I started off saying it in my head and then eventually I managed to say it out loud and that was a mindset shift that started me into you know starting a blog starting the creative pen which at the time seemed really really arrogant um, and and then from there it's pretty much been I've just written more books um, and then I had another shift in 2009 when I did a podcast interview with a friend Tom Evans about writer's block and I said something like I could never write fiction and he said well why not and I said well uh, I would have to write something like Umberto Eco's The Name of the Rose or it would have to win <laughs> it, would, it, would, it would have to win the Pulitzer Prize because I, I went to Oxford and my mum's an English literature professor I can only write that kind of book and be acceptable and he really changed my mind and and then I went on to start writing thrillers and and then here I am now. So it's kind of a crazy journey, but I wanted to point out the number of years. We're in 2014. So this is six years from, you know, my first book and eight, I guess, eight years since I had that affirmation. Right. So it's not, it doesn't happen overnight. It's like writing the book itself. Yeah. 
Exactly, it really is. And I want to stress that, you know, this book, Business for Authors, it contains everything I've learned from like 13 years as a business consultant and six years as an author. Um, yeah. And for most people, if you're, th if you're at the point of saying, I want to write a book, and, and that's as far as you are, you haven't written the first book yet, there's a whole lot of things to be thinking about, you know, before you have a business. But I hope that some people will actually want to do this as a career now, because it is viable. This is what's so exciting now. It is a, a viable um, business now to be an author. And at what stage did you say, okay, I need, so you were learning your craft as a writer. At what stage did you say, okay, but I need to I need to start building a business around this. Did, did you do one, then the other, or did you do them more in, in tandem? Uh, well, the first book I had thought at that point, I, I learned about blogging. I mean, you and I both know Copy Blogger, and, you know, I was reading yeah. blog, blogs like that. I think that's when I first came across you. Um, I think I did one of your courses that you did with um, uh, Brian Clark. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and, you know, met people like Johnny B. Truant, who now is also a fiction author. And, yes. you know, it's a, it, this crazy space we're in. But um, I started learning about blogging and I thought, OK, I'm going to become a blogger like because I knew I wanted to get out of my day job. Mm. So I thought I'll be a blogger. I'll, I'll write nonfiction books and I'll be a professional speaker. So I started to um, train up as a professional speaker and started speaking for income and things. So I knew I was going to get out of my day job somehow. I, I knew I could not implement any more accounts payable systems. <laughs> <laughs> so I had, I had this goal of getting out of my day job. Um, but when I started writing fiction, so I, and I started selling courses to authors, so I did sort of veer into the non-fiction, blogging, professional speaking angle um, yeah. then I started writing fiction I left my day job in three years ago now September 2011 and at that point I was making probably 90% of my income which was a lot less than as an IT consultant but 90% of it was non-fiction professional speaking and blogging related courses mm -hmm. but then as I in the last couple of years I've been writing more and more fiction I've my income split has really shifted so it's now up to about 45 percent fiction income and uh, still professional speaking I've just I've been in Stockholm recently I'm off to Frankfurt next week um, so that's still a big part of it and then I also still blog so I still blog I podcast so I have you know like yourself as an entrepreneur, this is why I use the word entrepreneur, yeah. Mo most people in our space don't have one income stream. If yeah. they did, that would be like a day job, <laughs> you know, and I don't, yeah. I really don't believe in having one income stream. I think it's, you know, super dangerous. So um, it, I, that's kind of where I am now is I have, and, and, and even if I end up 100% fiction, I still have lots of different books and nonfiction, I suppose. And also I sell on all the different platforms as well as from my own website. So basically my business now is a kind of conglomerate of all of these different things to make up a, a very good full-time income. Right, okay. And I'd like to pick up on what you said just now about it is now a viable career to be an author. Mm -hmm. Because as well as your own personal journey over these past few years, there's been an all big changes in the whole publishing industry. Mm -hmm. And I can relate to what you're saying. I mean, I started off in terms of the writing aspect of my business, blogging was, was a big part of that. And I was offered several book deals by publishers, and I always looked at it and thought, how can I afford to write that? Because, yeah. <laughs> you know, the, the, the terms on offer were just so, uh, you know, unenticing. But, mm. of course, in those days, you would write a book in or, as a business card in order to generate money for income. But my blog was kind of doing that for me. But it's really through your enthusiasm and, and CJ as well, the whole self-publishing revolution got it to the point where I realized, oh, okay, now I can write a book. Mm. So just maybe talk us through that whole change in the publishing landscape and, and critically why it makes it much more viable to make a living or mm. significant part of your living as an author. Mm. Well, uh, you know, when I first started doing this, there was no Kindle. I mean, this is what's so crazy. Like five years ago, there was no um, international Kindle. 
authors couldn't self-publish onto the Kindle. Um, we couldn't, there, there wasn't even such a thing as Kobo, which is really big, you know, in Canada and here in England. Uh, you know, we couldn't do audio books. Um, you know, we couldn't do easy print on demand. Uh, it, it's kind of just crazy how things have shifted. You know, you wouldn't be reading books on your cell phone, whereas now we see no. them, them everywhere. So what's happened with this tech technology shift and uh, really, I mean, America first, UK, Australia, you know, Canada are the markets that have really moved and we're still seeing, you know, Germany's just starting to move. We're still seeing the kind of emergence of this in the rest of the world. But what it's meant to authors is you can now self-publish. Now, I don't like the term self-publishing. I like independent author because uh, professional self-publishers use in profession, other professionals like professional editors and cover designers. So, you know, we don't do it by ourselves as such. But essentially, the financial shift is instead of, like you mentioned, getting between 15, you know, well, even seven and a half to 20 percent royalty. On, on a book, which is what you would generally get from traditional publishing, you can make 70, 70% from Amazon. So that means when I sell uh, an ebook at $4.99, I make $4.00 which is just crazy. <laughs> and, then, and I can do print on demand, which is just, um, for, for people who don't know, I upload some, a couple of PDF files, a cover and my interior up to cre Amazon's Create Space. And then my pr if someone goes onto Amazon today, they can order a print book. It, one copy is printed and sent to them. And if you're on Amazon Prime in America or the UK, you get it on the same day. <laughs> I mean, it's just, yeah. Yeah, it's just absolutely crazy. Or if you look, for my audiobooks on um, Audible, they're there as well, which I did a joint venture with a translator, uh, with a narrator. I've also done translation joint ventures. So basically, I'm running a, a, a global multimedia empire as, <laughs> <laughs> as an individual, and it hasn't, it's cost me not very much money because I pay editors, I pay cover designers, but it's free to self-publish. And this is like, I speak to publishers and they just can't believe it. They can't believe what we have now as authors. So, and and, and then I know people listening might be saying, oh, but isn't it a load of crap, you know, <laughs> which is the classic thing. But the main thing is that readers are not stupid. Readers will not buy a crap book. Uh, reviews will get you or it just won't sell at all or it won't get noticed. Um, and if people download a sample and it's not very good, they're not going to buy the book. So I don't think quality is an issue um, at all anymore. So essentially, the technology has enabled us to get our books out there and make more money per book. We can also sell direct from our websites if we do blogging and things like you and I do. Um, and the other thing I want to challenge people on is uh, if you think about the books that you love, so, you know, just hold those in your head. Now, say who published those books. And I bet you that most people can't name the publisher of those books. Most people don't shop by publisher. Yeah. They, they shop by author name or they shop by title because they're looking for something specific. So if somebody, you know, wants to uh, recover from reject, deal with rejection and criticism, um, they might find your book because that's what they're typing in to Amazon. If they're looking for um, how to market a book, they might find my book. So people want their questions answered. They want education. They want inspiration. They want escape and entertainment. They're not necessarily buying by publisher. So... No. You know, essentially you can, the other exciting thing for authors is you you get a monthly income that actually comes direct to your bank account <laughs> and you have cash flow monitoring because you know how much you're going to earn 60, 60 days later. So it's just, it, the, the business is revolutionized in ter terms of business. Yeah, and it, it's, I'll just second that. It is incredible, the tools that are available. Mm. I mean, to go and if you look at the, the quality of a CreateSpace paperback or Lightning Source, there's another system you can use. You can sit that side. If you've got a good designer, you need a really good cover. Mm. Uh, but you can sit that next to a, a paperback from one of the big five. And I've had clients who are designers say, I didn't realize it was self-published. 
So now the flip side of this is that we are being judged next to the offerings from the big five. So as Joe says, if the writing's not good, if the formatting's not good, if the cover's not good, readers are going to move on. Mm. But fortunately, anybody listening to this has got high aspirations of professionalism. So Yeah, and just, just to put it another way, um, I say to people now, do you go to a farmer's market at the weekend? You know, do you yeah. buy vegetables yeah, yeah. from, yeah. Do you buy clothes from a vintage store or a market? You know, like I go to Spitalfields and, and buy stuff. Do you watch indie documentaries on iTunes? You know, do you, all of these types of things, do you buy your, your gifts on Etsy or not on the high street instead of going to a chain store? You know, what's happening in the world is there's a shift to buying from creators. People want to buy local, buy from the author, you know, they want to support creatives directly. You know, look at Kickstarter, um, look yeah. at Patreon, which I'm now using for my podcast. You know, people actually want to support industry, creative industries. So, and I'm, I, I put direct sales of my my fiction on my website and my nonfiction uh, only a few months ago, which is odd considering how long we've been selling courses directly from our website. <laughs> but to my surprise, people would like to buy my eBooks from my website because they don't want to give the money to Amazon or, or Apple or the middlemen. So it's so interesting how this shift in the public's perception of indie and artisan, you know, Guy Kawasaki and um, he wrote a book, author, publisher, entrepreneur, uses the word artisanal publishing, that, yeah. we, that we actually care more because they are our books than a, than a big five publisher who publishes millions of books. They don't really care. But we care because we're doing it in, you know, individually and carefully. So I think if you shift it to that way around, it's like, well, of course you want to do it yourself. You're a creative. Yeah, and there was that really cool story a few months ago. In fact, it might have been on your podcast, Joe. Uh, there was some book fair, and they were interviewing teenagers queuing outside, and they said, who are you here to see? And instead of, they said, we want to see the indie authors, because that's who they wanted to be when they, when, you know, when they left school. And it was just so great that it's now starting to become something to aspire to, like you said, you know, and there's a really nice part in, in the book where you talk about looking at your, your young cousins and wanting to, you know, who are very creative and wanting to inspire them and say, you know, you can choose a creative career mm, if you yeah. want to do it. And this, 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 these are some of the tools to help you do it. Yeah, and I mean, obviously, we're not saying that you have to earn loads of money being a creative, but both, I mean, you, you know, your kids, you would like them to be able to do whatever they want to do in their in their life, and having a really good income actually really helps. <laughs> it's yeah, I mean, there's not so many drawbacks as the other way around, at least. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I really, I really feel this. I think it annoys me that this, you know, the myth of the starving artist in the garret, um, and that to be a good writer, you should be poor. <laughs> It's kind, yeah. of, it's kind of a crazy thing, and you, you and I both live in the abundance mentality of of the internet, uh, and generosity, and and the the ever growing pie. And you know, when you start thinking that way around books and writing and creativity, and you know, the whole thing, it's just, it, it it's so exciting. Every day, I'm just thrilled to be part of this this world and the, the indie community is so generous as well everyone's always sharing what they know um for, mostly for free or in a five dollar ebook you know you you can find out what any of us know it's just yeah you know it's it there are no secrets everyone's helping it's it's a great time to be an author right so let's suppose we're sold on that idea mm -hmm. and we say <laughs> okay what do I need to do? Let's say I'm starting out because another nice thing in the book is you've got the, the arc of the developing business and what we should focus on at different stages. So let's say I'm a complete beginner. Maybe I'm, I'm getting, you know, I've written my first book or I'm on the way to having that done. Mm -hmm. What are the things I need to be focusing on, on on the business side? Yeah, I think if you haven't finished the book yet, like if you haven't even got a book out in the world, I would start by finishing the book. <laughs> Um, yeah. because I actually think that a lot of, a lot of people will write one book, but not, 
you know, a lot of people will stop at that point and realise that this isn't what they want to do. And obviously a lot of people will never even write one book. But, I mean, you know, you've got the bug as well, haven't you now? I mean... Well, I've just finished my second book last week. So, yes, I know how you feel. <laughs> yeah, it's like, you know, and I, I've just launched today um, and I'm tomorrow I'm back in the library starting on the next book, you know. I mean, this is one, once you get the bug. But the thing is, you don't know if you've got the bug until you finish the first book. So I think for don't be too distracted if you haven't finished even one book yet. Um, that would probably be my main thing. And especially looking at, you know, working with editors, um, you know, getting the basics of finishing a product. I guess the probably the main thing to think about when you're doing this is if you want to do this as a business later on, you do have to be thinking around, you know, marketing stuff. You know, maybe you've started a blog. Maybe you're thinking about what you want to do with your business, um, you know, understanding professional editing, professional design, all of the fundamentals that go into making a book, um, that's kind of the important thing, because that's going to be your primary product. Um, and, and if people listening are not authors, then, you know, that's really the thing for any creative business. You need a product, whether your product is, as you have, coaching. Um, mm -hmm. You can't just become you know start coaching tomorrow <laughs> you know from, from nothing um you know there's time when we develop i guess that's the developing the craft and the experience yeah. type of thing but then i think once you've actually got the book done then your big challenge is realizing that nobody cares <laughs> <laughs> which i think i think most people i mean you, you yeah. have, don't i mean you think that's so, right <laughs> yeah so there's the great cartoon that hugh mcleod did on gaping void that just it's, it's like the, you know the classic town uh sign welcome you to the town it says welcome to nobody cares population six billion <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and that's really tough because when when we've put all the the love and the energy and, and and care into creating something, and you look out there and just think, well, guess what? There's a load of others who've done just the same. So what? Now then, the question is, wh what do I do to actually get people to care? Yeah, and this is where you realise that you haven't made a million dollars from one book, um, and you actually have to learn about marketing or if you've been published by a publisher you you generally find that your book doesn't you know everyone doesn't learn about marketing. <laughs> yeah basically you have to learn about marketing and and it's it's interesting when you talk to agents and publishers and you read industry publishing industry blogs they say the most disappointed person is the author whose book has been published about six weeks six weeks after publication because that initial launch fun has worn off the book has dropped down the charts and now the publishers moved on to the next author and that's it you know it, that you know there's this disappointment and i think there is a psychological shift is that you have to go okay so it's up to me then regardless of how the book is published or whatever your business is now i have to start to learn marketing and that happened to me when i printed 2000 copies of my first book and they sat in my house in australia this was before the kindle um, and I didn't know about print on demand. I printed 2000 copies and then went, okay, how do I sell these? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I ended up putting most of them in the landfill um, because I discovered print on demand. Um, but it, it was a great lesson. I'll never forget that one. Um, but essentially at that point, you have to learn about marketing. Then you make another decision. They're like decision points all the way. Do I enjoy this enough that I want to go through it again? So it's because it's not just writing the book, it's then the marketing side. And if like us, you know, this is marketing. You and me having a chat is marketing. This is the thing. If you reframe marketing into something fun, like both of us like writing, so we blog. You know, both of us enjoy Twitter. We like going to events. We both speak. These are things that we do. Um, and other people can do and they are marketing so you have to find the marketing that you enjoy and then you can essentially consider what you want to do next so are you going to go deeper into one genre are you going to switch are you going to you know ha what are you going to do with your creative products that work into some kind of business model and what are the things I should be looking out for 
I mean, let's, let's assume I'm not making a million dollars with my first book in six weeks. But what are the things I should be tracking that let me know, okay, I'm going in the right direction. The, the, I, what I'm doing now is going to grow the business for the long term. What, what are some of the indicators I should look for? Well, I think like like any, again, like any small business, you should have a website and an email list kind of sign up because one of the best, th like what will happen with your first book is it's unlikely you're going to have an email list of, of lots of people. I mean, most of us start with zero. Well, everybody starts yeah. with zero. Um, but if you start an email list off the back of your first book, by the time you have your second book, you should have 10, 100 a thousand people on that list who will be ready for the next book. So that's a really sensible thing to do is make sure at the back of the first book it says, if you enjoyed this, sign up here to get something else for free or whatever and uh, be on my list for your next book. So that's one thing to do. And then the next thing is to start writing another book, um, whatever that is, or you know, if you're gonna use that as part of your business, think about how, you know, create a workshop out of that book or, or however you're going to repackage it but essentially you you know as we said at the beginning one income stream is dangerous you're never going to make a living from one product it just it just doesn't happen at all so you have to think about what are the other products I'm going to create and then in terms of measuring you know you could even be for fiction writers you know we often do measure word count I don't think it's so common within other industries but you know to actually I say now I measure my life by what I create so if I'm not creating regularly actually and by creating I mean here is a finished book um, then you know I'm not doing my job properly so it's really tracking that you know you could track word count you could track you know chapters by the end of the month or something so you know you're ticking towards your goal and at this point you probably have another day job or another income stream because you know as I said it's not a full-time income yeah and, okay so I'd like to just reiterate what Joe said about the importance of an email list because if, if you're looking around thinking should I blog should I tweet should I have a Facebook page or a podcast whatever all of those things are kind of nice if you enjoy them and they can all be done really effectively but none of them, certainly in my experience and most people I talk to, none of them will have the impact of an email list. And if you think about your own experience, you don't see every Facebook update the stream. You don't see everything that goes in your Twitter stream. But you probably see just about every email that hits your inbox. And that's the reason why email is so powerful. So, you know, one metric you can start tracking from day one is how many subscribers am I getting? And even if it's only in the tens, tens or, or you know, scores, yeah, or one, <laughs> well, that, that is, that's a, another potential reader for the next book, which is a huge, you know, that's mm. an asset that you're building for the business. Mm. And the uh, other thing is just, you know, we've got to think about future proofing. So um, there are some people who believe you should go all in on Amazon, but you know, I saw a documentary with uh, Jeff Bezos and Charlie Rose last year. And, and Jeff said, you know, Amazon will be disrupted in the same way that Amazon has disrupted other industries. You know, it will yeah. be disrupted. Like we've just seen Alibaba IPO, um, you know, come out and people going, Oh, this is new. You know, this is something interesting. And I, I think if you have an email, if you own your own website, and you pay for hosting, you own your own email list, you own the rights to your products. Yes. Nobody can take this business away from you, ever, you know, because you own that stuff. And if all of this goes wrong, you know, if Facebook disappears, if Amazon disappears, if, if everything else goes, you'll still have your products, the rights you own, the website, and an email list. So that I'm like you, you know. And, and also, I think I'm a bit gun-shy because in 2008, 400 of us, including me, got laid off on one day during the global financial crisis. And at the time, that was my one income stream. And when I got laid off, along with everyone else, I swore I would never rely on one thing again. <laughs> Right, right. So if there's one part of this recording that I could kind of highlight with yellow highlight, it would be this. Build your own assets, folks. Mm. More product, as in more books, that's intellectual property. Maybe we can talk about the rights that can kind of come out of that. More your own website, so you've got your own property online, and your own mailing list, which gives you a hotline to your readers. Mm. Now, those three things 
give you the foundation. And it's like, I, you know, when people say to me, isn't it, isn't it a bit risky being self-employed? And I said, well, no one can sack me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and if you have an email list, if you create something they want, you can make money from, you know, selling people what they want. So it, it, exactly. it, that's how it works. Uh, and and I, I know where we are, both you and I have been doing this a number of years now. And maybe we sound a bit blasé but at the beginning we were both scared and we both you know it was difficult and it was and you know when I gave up my job to do this full time there was a big self-esteem drop about you know people look at you funny and treat you funny when you don't have a proper job <laughs> but, yeah, yeah well, you know yeah I mean it, again you know it's not it's not land of milk and honey, at least straight away. Look, no crystal here. Yeah, <laughs> it's hard work, and you know it makes sense, obviously, not to be relying on that that one book to mm. to be paying all the bills to begin with. But mm. the joy of what Joe is describing here is you're building something. Yeah. you're building your artistic uh, oeuvre. You know your 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 body of work. You're building the mailing list, the intellectual property, your web presence. If you do this right and you keep even just track it this month compared to last month, if you sold one more book than last month, got one more subscriber than last month, mm. it's growing. Mm. And I, I, I tell people to measure this in Olympic periods because in one year you can you can feel like you haven't really got very far but if you try and think about like where you were during the um you know the london olympics and then before that whatever that was the beijing olympics and then if you think where you're going to be during the rio olympics every four years things can really really change and i between one between between beijing and and london i you know I had become a fiction author, I'd left my job, you know, loads of big shifts had happened over four years. So people, you can definitely achieve this, you know, if you want this, but it takes time and it takes effort consistently. It's like, I say this, it's like diet and exercise. You, you know what to do, <laughs> and it, but it's one of those, it's simple, but it's not easy type, yeah. of, type of things. Yeah. Okay, so let, let's back to our imaginary author she's written the first book she's building the mailing list she's getting the first sales the first reviews of the book mm -hmm. building the next one what's the next phase of the journey yeah so realistically the kind of the next bit is when you have a couple of books so i saw i think there's a jump at three if three is within the same genre or as you are non-fiction, you know, three to the same audience. So if you can yeah. sell one, they're likely to buy two or three. So there's a jump at three, there's a jump at five, and then things, you know, become more regular. You know, when you've only got one book, you might, some months you might not earn any money at all from that book. But since I've had three books, I've earned money every month. And since I've had five, it's, it's, it's jumped up. So, um, I interview people, and, and again, this might sound crazy, but the, there are people who are making very, very good money who have over 15 books. So CJ Lyons would be somebody uh, in that group. I, I just interviewed Steve Scott. I don't know if you've heard of him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, he does non-fiction. He does non-fiction, yeah, and he's got 42 books. <laughs> They're all very short, though, I would say that. But but the thing is, there is a business. You've got to think about your business model. When, you've, when you want to go full-time, so when you've got maybe three to five books, you're really thinking, am I going to be able to leave my day job? Am I? Can I make this a full-time career? So you have to make some decisions around what you're going to do next and start thinking about your strategy. Um, you know, So, for example, getting clear on your brand, that's when I really thought about, okay, I'm going to be JF Penn for my thrillers because they're, I'm not this shiny, happy person. I'm like this <laughs> the dark, little, twisted thing. It's the shadow. You know all about the shadow. Yes. Um, you know, that's my shadow. And um, so I wanted to split my brand. That was like a, a decision you make when you've done a couple of books because it, we're all a work in progress, right? But it helps to have that. And then maybe you're writing a series. Maybe you decide my business model is going to be like yours is, you know, speaking, coaching, and books are a 
a small part or like me I've decided I want speaking to be I, I want my speaking to be 20% of my income I want my books to be 80% so I'm working towards that um, thinking about scalable income you know, I'm sure you've talked about this, but scalable is you create it once, it can earn you money forever, which is a book, whereas speaking or coaching, you do it and that time is gone. So thinking about how your business model is going to work uh, and establish your criteria, I guess, for, for going full time. And I, that's what I did. So I had said, I have to be making this amount of money before I give up my job. Um, yeah. So I was working part, you know, I went to part time work, I was doing evenings, weekends before work, you know, until I was earning X amount, then I could give up my job with the knowledge that I would have to go back to it if I couldn't sustain yeah. an income so I think when you've got three to five books you're really thinking about those types of issues yes and note Joe is not saying leap and the net will appear or quit your job overnight no I'm saying it took me you know it took me pretty much three years of working part-time to yeah. to do this and in fact I'll tell this story because this is really important back probably 2004 2002 or 2004 you know a while back i i had reached another i i just got divorced um my first marriage i'm happily married now <laughs> but you know at the time i just got divorced i was miserable and i quit everything i sold my house at that time quit everything in order to write the great novel as uh -huh. you do uh 3 months later having written nothing except a few poems, uh, angsty divorce poems, <laughs> um, I went back to my day job full of kind of just, I can't do this, that I just could never do this, this is not me. Um, my self-esteem crushed and I, I didn't write again for another, what, four or five years. So I would say to people that you do not need to leave your job to write a book. In fact, it's better to write at the edges of the day, as Toni Morrison says. Um, so I would get up at five and write for an hour before work. I would, um, in the evenings, I would blog and do social networking. and At the weekends, I would write. So I think it's better to do that, work part time and only give up your job when you're really certain and when you have money coming in. Well, and that's a great example, Joe, of what we were talking about right back at the beginning of the value of the business really is it will support your creativity. Mm. At that stage, you didn't have a business model and you didn't have the, you know, the infrastructure around you that would support you. And, you know, it's a pretty soul crushing experience to go through. Mm. So, again, if, if anybody's thinking that there's that there has to be a fundamental conflict between business and creativity. What you're describing is that the two actually, one supports the other. Oh, definitely, definitely. And, you know, now, I mean, even when you're a full-time creative, you know, you still have to do all the other stuff. So it, it will always be a mutually supportive kind of side um, and, and I, I hope you agree. I mean, you can't be creative all hours of the day. I mean, you can only you know you have that well <laughs> every day and then you you know yeah. you do something else so it, it yeah it's fantastic but what I think I would also say to people remember when I said I couldn't even say I am creative out loud I didn't used to have ideas and now I just overflowing with ideas and that's something that happens more and more as it's like a muscle isn't it you you exercise that creative muscle and over time it just you know, and now the ideas for my books, I just have lists and lists of books that I'm going to write. And that only happens over time, basically. So be, be easy on yourself, people. Be nice to yourself. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, maybe we could finish up by looking at maybe the later stage in the business. So mm -hmm. I imagine the author's got a few books out. She's making significant income every month. Maybe she's even left her job. Mm. What are some of the things that she needs to be doing to, to really maximize the value of her work and to accelerate the growth of the business? Right, well, this is, and this is kind of where I am now. And writing this book, it was helping me shift phase from, mm -hmm. you know, 
being a businesswoman and an author to I am CEO of my creative company, you know, and you, you only feel like a CEO when you know what you're doing. And writing this book helped me understand how it all worked. So one, you want to exploit your rights. So we talked a bit before about one manuscript is an ebook, a print book, an audio book in English. It can also, that English book, those three products can be sold all over the world in English, so Indies can sell in 170 countries now, and I, I have personally sold in 58 countries, so that's in English, three products in English times 58. Then yeah. you can start looking at translations, so I'm now, tra I'm collaborating with seven translators, I've got books, <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> I know, it's, it's, it's going off, I've got books in German, Spanish, Italian, I've just signed Portuguese for Brazil, Brazilian Portuguese, right. um, all of those are joint venture partnerships, 50-50 royalty splits, so I'm not even paying them up front, which is crazy, because translators are creative people too, and they want to do this stuff, I, I really believe that collaboration is the future of of creative business I totally believe it so that's one thing is taking that one product if you know if it is a book and turning it into multiple income streams and then if you think that I've now got 12 books each of those can become all of those multiple income streams you can see how this is a valid business model because you know it really is endless and limitless how many things you can turn these things into so that that's one thing and then you have to be considering things like your processes so when you first self-publish a book it's a bit complicated you know um <laughs> yes <laughs> in the same way as like you know when you first use wordpress as a blogger it's a bit complicated you have to go through the process a few times so for me now as i said i have 11 contractors you know i i have my editors i have my cover designer i have bookkeeper you know i'm doing my accounts right now you have you have to put your processes in place as you develop your your business properly um, then things like uh, <laughs> this I, I have to mention it because I think it's really important if you want to you know expand is the production plan so the production plan which you know you think of in like a factory is <laughs> you know I am going to it's more like a promise you know you can say it's like a part of your business plan um, you know maybe writing a business plan is a good idea um, but a production plan is uh, I will be writing this in this month and therefore I can book my editor for this month, I can book my cover designer, I can see that I'm going to create three products next year, that's going to give me this type of cash flow. So when you actually start planning and you know forecasting and thinking about strategy, these are words that business people use. And I love, you know, I love the just the general let's just be creative and make stuff attitude but then you almost need to put on your other hat if you want to expand this and I, I mean I think I'm really talking to those people who are ambitious you know who want to earn really good money of which yeah. I am one and I think you are as well uh-huh <laughs> I mean we come from this side where we don't see these things as being mutually exclusive I, you know and and my friend this is what's so great my friends in this industry many of them are making six and seven figures from their you know their fiction and their and their books which to yeah. me is truly exciting <laughs> so I think if you um consider those type of things um you actually get your financials sorted. I'm amazed at how many creatives don't have a bookkeeper. I mean, I can't stand entering my receipts into QuickBooks or whatever. So, you know, I love paying my bookkeeper. Um, and then, yeah, looking at the longer term view, that's just, um, there's been a good book recently, Good Strategy, Bad Strategy, um, by a, a guy called Richard Remount, which I, I really enjoyed and was basically, strategy is what you don't do as much as what you do yeah. and that really helped me and I've written about it in the book is to say what I have to say no to because you spend so much time when you're growing your business saying yes all the time yeah. and then yeah. suddenly you have to start saying no to everything <laughs> yeah and it's really scary when you first start doing it isn't it 
yes and I still struggle and then I regret it later I'm like oh why did I say yes to that you know and and often you, you know how it is as a speaker people will ask you for stuff and and then you'll be like oh no why did I do that and and so when you act and and I think this goes in the business plan as well is what I am so for me I am an author I'm an author a speaker and an entrepreneur and that's the order they are in so yeah. Every day I should be working around my author business, my speaker business is secondary, and, and the entrepreneur is a kind of overarching, but I used to sell courses and I'm selling them less and less now. I'm focusing more on, on books. So knowing what you can say no to is really important as you become the CEO of your creative company. Excellent. Well, thank you, Joe. I mean, you know, I think we've covered a lot of ground here from the little acorn of the first few words of the first book to this huge spreading oak tree of your multinational multimedia empire. And it's really, I mean, you know, cause we, we've been in touch for a few years and I've seen your journey. I've seen your business grow and your, the catalog grow. And it really is inspiring to see this. And, also, you know, the other thing I want to underline is Joe works insanely hard, like really, <laughs> really hard. There's a reason why you've got, what, 11 books or something? 12, 12. <laughs> 12 books in six years. I mean, that's pretty, that's a pretty impressive production rate. So thank you for your generosity. Honestly, I heartily recommend the book. And even, like I said, even if you are not a an author i would recommend you check this out and it's what five dollars yeah something like that i mean it's, it's really you you will get way more than five dollars value if you're, even if you're not an author if you are an author then and you're serious about making this a career you really should read it it's it's great so it presumably it's on amazon and all the usual um the online you know where do people go to get the book where's the best place to yeah so it's available now as an ebook on all platforms as a print book on amazon and barnes and noble and also an audio book so um if you go to the creative pen dot com forward slash business book all the links are there and that's a uh, creative pen with a double n <laughs> yeah but um, no, thanks so much for having me, Mark. It was great to talk to you, and uh, and you you continue to inspire me as a creative businessman as well. Well, thank you, Joe. Oh, oh, and the other thing I want to point people to is a you've got a great blog at thecreativepen.com, the double N, and also you, Joe's podcast. I listen to every week, and it's it's really one of the very best ways of getting to know what's going on in the publishing industry. You always have amazing guests on. You learn all kinds of stuff. So if, again, if you're really if you're interested in in publishing, writing, publishing your own books, have a listen to the Creative Pen, and within a few weeks you will be an expert in the current state of uh, self publishing. Oh well, thank thanks for having me, Mark. Okay, my pleasure. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>